I wanted to end the year on a high note, but instead ended up with a very mixed bag, which I actually feel like is more representative of 2022 as a year in cinema. Although there were a couple highlights, I, none of them landed for me in this last week of reviews for the year. I'm going to start off with White Noise, which is the latest film from Noah Baumbach, who I have mixed feelings on. I, a lot of his stuff I'm not a huge fan of that people really love, like Marriage Story is a good example, where I just did not find it particularly compelling, but people loved it. And White Noise is an Adam Driver, Noah Baumbach reunion. I do really like some of the things he's written. I don't know how I feel about him as a writer, director, producer, etc. And I think that is something that I talk about constantly, where these certain directors or, or filmmakers or whoever it is, like they hit this level and then nobody questions them and people just hand them projects or let them do whatever because of prestige or because they think it's an awards play. And the editing and the the sort of objectivity goes out the window. And White Noise, to me, feels like one of those projects. Also, I want to point out, I was looking up Noah Baumbach's filmography because I was like, do I like him as a director, writer, etc., whatever? And I noticed that Madagascar 3, Europe's Most Wanted, he is credited as screenwriter. So go figure, that one kind of stands out on his filmography. Anyway, back to White Noise. Apparently, this is an adaptation. I was not aware of that going into it. I don't think it would have mattered. I, I think it actually would have made my experience worse, I'm guessing, if I was a fan of the source material. And I keep reading about how it was an unfilmable source material. And whenever somebody tackles one of those things, I'm like, well, then maybe don't. The amount of hubris in being like, I am going to be the one to do this. But then by the same token, you end up with people who do take on massive projects that are considered unfilmable and you end up with amazing things. Like I, I personally think Lord of the Rings is a good example where Peter Jackson took on something that Probably nobody was like, oh, this should be a film and, and made one of my favorite series. Anyway, I digress. White Noise is about a family and Adam Driver plays the father. Greta Gerwig plays the mother. They're sort of a mixed family. They've both been married multiple times. They have this relationship. Ah, this is one of those movies where a couple, everybody in the movie actually speaks in a very stylized way that nobody actually talks to each other that way in real life. And some movies the dramatized performance of it is great. And in this movie, I found it very grating. And also, it just became literal white noise. Maybe that's the point. And I was able to, not able to, I kept kind of zoning out and being like, what would, and then they'd say something that was, I'm not gonna say sensationalized, but there'd be certain words I'd be like, did I hear that right? And then I come back and they'd be like, oh yes. For example, and I, I hate to say this in a, you know, Adam Driver's character is a, a, the leading expert on Hitler. And I, I don't think they're implying that he's like a Nazi in it, but, you know, it's it's just it, it starts off that way. And I was like, I am already not the most invested in whatever is happening right now. Again, I feel like ugh, the other thing about this movie is it felt cheap and I think it was going for stylized, but it felt cheap. And there are some moments like there's a supermarket that comes into play that I was like, OK, this I think this is the style that you were going for, but you didn't sort of permeate it across the other things, I think it's, it, I don't know if it's a period piece or a film that sits outside of time, but everyone looks a little bit 80s. You have seen the photos or videos of the trailer, whatever it is, and you look at Greta Gerwig's hair, you you know, you, you get a sense of, but I'm, I'm either way. It, notice that I'm not talking about anything of substance because there's nothing of substance in this film as far as I'm concerned. You know, there's this sort of semi-quirky family dynamic because, the, you know, he had kids, she had kids. They all interact together, but it feels so forced and surface level. Then the plot, it, eventually, after we get over the weird, you know, area of study part, becomes about, you know, there's some sort of semi-apocalyptic chemical event, and they're dealing with the fallout of it, and it feels like it's maybe trying to be a commentary on the pandemic, or the timing of it is trying to be a commentary on the pandemic, but it doesn't feel like it does a good job, and I just, I could, I couldn't, I couldn't do it. I, I could not get into this movie. I, I don't, you know, if, if you, if you watch this and you dig it, good for you. But I cannot in good conscience recommend, there's literally nobody I can think of in my life that I'd be like, oh, you know what? You might like white noise. So I'm going to give it a two out of five. And then next I have Puss in Boots, The Last Wish, which, you know, I'd actually heard pretty good things about this and I figured why not? You know, everything else towards the end of the year tends to be really depressing and awards bait or just a slog like white noise. So I said, yeah, I'll give myself a little treat in the form of Puss in Boots, The Last Wish, which uh, you can just turn your brain off for. I'm, I'm not going to lie, which sometimes is enjoyable. And I think the thing I have not seen, I, I'm 99% sure I did not see the first Puss in Boots. I tapped out of the Shrek franchise a while ago. No, no disrespect to it. I just lost interest, I guess. But I do think the original Shrek 
is an incredibly funny movie. And I actually rewatched it, I think, last year towards the holidays because it was hitting its 20th year, something along those lines. And I'm going to just go ahead and say it still held up. So I, the thing I like about things in the Shrek universe is that they are – there are jokes in them that are more mature and that are funnier and that, you know, as you're older, you do get, I, I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, sized jokes in the first Shrek movie that maybe you don't quite get the f- upon first viewing if you're a little kid. But now that you're like, oh, I can't believe they got away with that. So Puss in Boots is a little less in that department, but there are a couple things. There are a couple, you know, recurring jokes or whatever it is that I legitimately laughed out loud during and, and they are, I'm not going to say pandering, but they are. They sit. They could probably sit outside of the story of Puss in Boots and still be funny to me. So I'll I'll give them credit though. Like a laugh is a laugh. It, it, I don't even know if it's worth describing the plot of this one. But you know, Puss in Boots is still an outlaw or is an outlaw. Can I don't remember if I've seen it. Antonio Banderas is back to voice him. Salma Hayek is Kitty Softpaws, who I guess is a character who may have been introduced before, but she's a lady outlaw cat. And then you've also got Olivia Coleman, Harvey Guillen, John Mulaney, and Florence Pugh joining, as well as Wagner Mora, Samson Ko, Divine Joy Randolph, and Ray Winstone. And, you know, again, the plot is just so, it's it's cut and paste from fairy tales, and, and we have to go find a last wish, which is a literal manifestation of a wish. I really enjoyed John Mulaney's character. He plays, I, mean, I don't think this is a spoiler, he plays the bad guy in it, and he plays little or not little anymore Jack Horner who is you know again I think this is where the adult humor comes in where the motivations of this character is very like corporate CEO boss billionaire etc whatever collector and I don't know if kids will understand that but they'll just go okay cool bad guy I understand because I understand fairy tales and whatever these things I think Harvey is a a fantastic addition to this he brings a sort of joy and softness I kept having to remember that Florence Pugh is actually British when I was listening to this because I was like oh, that is her real accent that she's doing, which I don't think she gets to do a lot. And uh, she plays Goldilocks. Olivia Coleman plays Mama Bear. I don't, I don't know. But the, look, if you have kids, this is uh, effectively a no-brainer. If you are a fan of the Shrek franchise, I feel like you'll probably like this one if because you like the other ones. If you are an adult without kids and, and, and neither of those things, maybe it's not for you. But again, like I said, this is a you don't have to know anything going into it. I mean, you can pay attention. And I, I sort of, I paid attention. That's it. That's I shouldn't be rude to this movie. I did pay attention to it, but it did not require a lot of brain power in order to do so, which made it entertaining. And it was unexpected in the sense that I had very low expectations going in and I had a, you know, a decent time. So for what it is, I'm actually going to give it a 3.7 out of 5. And the last film I have this week is called Corsage, and it is effectively a biopic, which I probably should have realized going into it. I wasn't sure if it was based on a real empress or a fictional one. I actually don't think it necessarily matters for this. I think what matters is that we are getting this portrait of a female character and the constraints that she was under and the sort of burdens that she was under then that, yeah, a lot of them sadly probably are still applicable today. I think the strength of this movie comes from two things. One is Vicky Crepe's performance. And I apologize if I am butchering her name, but I think she is such an incredible and watchable actress. She is just, there's a, a magnetism to her. You may, if you've seen The Phantom Thread, you probably know what I'm talking about. But, you know, she brings this uh, sort of subtle joys and also subtle sets. She's just a great, subtle actress, but it can also do broader moments. Anyway, I think she is half the driving force of this movie. And I think the other driving force is that it is written and directed by a woman and you can feel the societal burdens weighing down on this character in such a real way that even though she is the one percent of one percent in a time that you know we are past you can still feel the crushing weight of what people want from her and these unrealistic expectations and all these things you know they still talk about weight and looks and and men are making digs and and you know being afraid of newer model women coming into her husband's life and you know, just all the things that are, unfortunately, at this point, it feels like still timeless or relevant today. And yes, it is odd to have it be relatable through the lens of this very, very, very elite character. But I think the idea behind it, and I think it successfully conveys that, is to show that it doesn't matter what level you, you of society, of, of, you know, culture, whatever you are at, if you're a woman, you have gone through or are going through or whatever it is. What some of these things in your life, and I do find that relatable. I, it's not to say this is not a film that is accessible to male audiences, but you know, I do think women will resonate very strongly with the story and the performances and the double standards and all just all of it. 
you know, it's it moves along pretty quickly. I, I think it's very watchable. Again, I think Vicky's performance is the driving force behind it. And I don't see a reason not to watch this movie. I do think it is subtitled. Oh, no. So, uh, you know, get over it. But I, I think it's worth watching. I'm going to give it a 3.8 out of 5. 